Everybody, and thanks for uh, being here. The first panel for uh, the day for Cape, and uh, this is our uh, uh, quote unquote Fright Night uh, panel. Uh, my name is Bill Almond from uh, Boom 1019. I know a lot of you probably listen to the radio. Yes, that's where you go. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes Bill. We know you well, Bill. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm obviously not the person you want to see today. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, to the first panel Amanda Burse and William Rack. Honored to have you guys here today. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I know this is a couple of years in the making. Uh, yeah, right. It supposed to be a couple of years ago, uh, but we're all here. We're all uh, waiting. I know there's going to be a lot of questions being asked, uh, but I think that uh, I'll start uh, because uh, you know when I go around talking to people, I do this. So people are coming in. The biggest question they're going to ask, uh, and I'm sure you guys have heard this on the panels you've done before. What's it like working with, you know? With, with William Ragsdale? That's it, yes. yes. <laughs> Can't really say. Cause, yeah. But I think that's really where people will start, right? If, you know, uh, you're on set on a day, whether it's the movie or whether you're on Married with Children or Herman's Head, you know, working with such uh, other other actors. What is it like working with some of those other big names that you've been able to, to work with? Well, everybody's different, aren't they? <laughs> sure There's a story behind everyone, and then, and then you know I've been a director behind the camera for mm -hmm. 30 years, so I had a different sort of relationship with actors and various actors. Uh, did you all here get a show called Mad TV by any chance? Yes. Okay, I directed six years of that, and so we had a lot of amazing guest stars, including Academy Award winning actors and things, and and, and bands that um, I would get to meet and. Um, so it's a trip. It's an honor, as you say, and it's an honor for us to be here, by the way. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having us. But, um, you know, it really is a unique experience. I always have high hopes that people are going to be nice. <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 yes, they do. They do get dashed sometimes. But, you know, I, I, I think it's important to meet people um, with that kind of optimism. And, uh, as a director, I try to create an environment on the set that's friendly and well, warm and welcoming because I think you get the most out of people when you do that. Um, there are exceptions to prove the rule, but uh, um, yeah, you want to talk about Friday night or? Uh, sure. I guess we might as well. No, I mean what it was like there. We... Uh, yeah, uh, mostly what people ask is what it was like to work with Marty McDowell. Yeah. And, um, and Chris Sarandon as well. And Chris oh, Sarandon, that, yeah. and, uh, who is still with us, yeah. thank God. Um, they were great. They were great. Uh, we were the younger set in, in those days, and uh, they, they were both very warm and welcoming and supportive. And um, you can talk about Chris. Roddy was a. Uh, uh, Really generous, giving, available, accessible, fun guy who, like us, had started out very young in the business and had uh, grown and matured and all of that. And, and uh, you were nine when we made Frank. I was nine and a half. <laughs> okay, okay. Because Rod, no, Roddy had been in Hollywood since he was nine years old, so he knew everyone. He had literally As, escaped the Nazis to come to America. And, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, it was in England. They, started, yeah. they, they, they left England okay. to, to come to the U.S. to uh, you know, weather that out and end up staying forever. Well, and it really, truly, both Roddy and, and Chris Rand, and you know, Roddy was iconic in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and Chris was very, very accomplished. I mean, he was nominated for an Academy Award on his first feature, uh, Dog Day Afternoon. And, but they treated us as equals, and there's no greater feeling than, as opposed to being intimidated, or yeah. it, it, uh, it, it made it 
so much more fun. And this movie is fun. I think that's a lot of why people enjoy Fright Night because it it takes the the monster aspect very seriously. It takes what this character, what Billy's character goes through very seriously. But there's also a lot of humanity and humor in the film. And I think that's part of why it's had some longevity over the years. Yeah. Wonderful. I, 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 I'm going to open it up the floor to questions. Come on up to the microphone if you want to talk about Step right up. Right Come right on. Right up. Who's going to be brave? Or well, I'll just keep talking and then you'll be like, well, somebody please step up to the mic so she'll stop. Okay, we have a brave soul. Yes, and I've seen you, but I haven't met you. What's your name? Lisa. Lisa. Pleasure. So what was it like working on Married with Children? Oh, in a nutshell. Okay. <laughs> Some all Let's ten years. Just sum up ten years. No, I mean seriously though. When you are with a company of players, and we had the great good fortune of a lot of crew people who were with us throughout the entire ten year run, and that's a long time, especially in Hollywood land. But think about it. When you're in school and you go through grade one to 10, or you know, you, you change and people are different year after year. And so things did change, um, but for the most part, we were there sort of in a way feeling like, are we, and you were part of early Fox years. Is this for real? Is this network for real? Because there, they said there would never be a fourth network. Because in the US it was ABC, CBS, and NBC. So when Fox came along in the early days, of cable television, we were all just like, what are we doing? Is this really? Are these checks going to clear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, truly. But it was also, there was something sort of loose and fun with that energy about, well, because we could fail. Because the stakes in Hollywood are so high that you've got to make a, a, a landing, a strong landing quickly. And there's always sort of that tension and that pressure that goes with that. but. With, with the new network, it was sort of like, well, they don't have a high expectation of us, so we could just play. Well, the, cur and the, the, the currency for Fox uh, at, at that point was, we're just going to do something different. Because these other three guys have been doing the same thing for years and years and years. So we're going to do Tracy Ullman, we're going to do The Simpsons, we're going to do you know, outside of the box stuff. So, uh, so but yeah, on the set of Mary, we were trying to make people laugh. This was a show that had never there had never been anything quite like it. And this is... Uh, this Most is families saying, were more like the Bundys and the, <laughs> the neighbors. Yeah. Right. And they, they, the original concept was the anti-Cosby. Yeah. And that was when that show and, and it was very popular in the U.S. And it was all this happy, friendly, talk nice to each other kind of family. Respectful. The there you go. Respectful. And there wasn't anything respectful. <laughs> no. um, but, um, and I think because when I got behind the camera, I, I love crew. I grew up doing theater. So when I think of Very Good Children, I don't think just of the cast. I think of the whole company of people that were involved. Because there's easily 100 plus folks that make that show happen every week. So it was often fun, and it's a lot of work. Don't get me wrong; it's a it's a bit of it's a bit of a job to do, but I was thrilled to do it. Just last question. Yes. Uh, which was your favorite season and or episode filming Mary with Children? Wow. <laughs> um, and as you can tell, I don't I don't talk in a straight line. I don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm not succinct. Um, Gosh, it's a hard Attention one. Attention all key personnel, code Batman. Okay, is that for me? Is that for me? I've got to go. Say, tell me. <laughs> Well, I'll always remember the first show I directed. It wasn't necessarily that magnificent of a show. Um, and then I got to direct a lot of episodes that featured Christina Applegate. She and I love working with one another. And um, I do remember filming the um, the pirate episode when, when David Garrison would come back, Steve, my first husband, it was always fun to have him back. And so the pirate episode, they were really making fun of him.
because David was a Broadway guy and David did Pirates of Penzance. And so that's why they were <laughs> trying to humiliate him in their beloved way. Um, that was pretty fun to shoot a show on a pirate show. So I'd have to say that that might have been one of my favorites. And I'm just gonna say that I've always loved Married with Children. Thank and you, Lisa. I was about five years old when it uh, aired, but it was Bath time, married with children, then bedtime. <laughs> wow. Any nightmares in there at all? No. Okay. Okay, good. That's right. That's why, the way, that's that's why, that's why Herman's head's ratings drop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure because all the moms went and put the kids to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Were you on at 9.30? Nice. Sorry, I missed <laughs> <it. laughs> <laughs> Um, and just before we get to the question, I wanted to just follow up with Herman said in the early days of Fox and then in the early 90s. You had the same kind of sense that you were just, like, we're just doing something different here, trying to, trying to figure it out as you went along? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you would, you, you would tell, in my situation, you would tell people what Herman said was about, and I'm like, what? What is it? So, this guy opens his head or whatever, you know, yeah. But yeah, and but people really likewise people oh, just respond to stuff. Code Batman, all clear. <laughs> okay, we can all let's all collectively heave a sigh of relief. Yes. You're welcome. We're all okay. <laughs> okay. You know, he was gone for a minute. I don't know. If we yeah. Know. Yeah. We double this here. Uh, John. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just wondering. Uh, well, sort of uh, directly that boat. Uh, whether it be Roddy or Chris or Andy or anybody that. When you both, like, because you were relatively young when you started then, was there any uh, advice that they gave you uh, that you kept and you know, like, you used you yourself? I learned by watching. I don't know that I was actually ever, unless I asked. I don't know that it was offered no, as there was never a teaching going on. Right. I but I always learned by watching others. And not just the work, you know, the acting itself, but the, the demeanor on set. Um, and I I was taught professionalism doing theater starting young and I always respected that and and especially to yeah. Roddy and Chris were embodied that. Uh, and it's it's admirable, and it's not always it's not always there, and uh, especially now. And um, yeah, it was really really void of any kind of ego at all, even from Roddy. You know, he was friends with some of the most famous people around. Yes, yeah, so it was. I didn't encounter that kind of thing until later. But yeah, so it was a great introduction. You know, really super. Well, and it's often it's often the folks that really aren't deserved of that kind of um, respect that are the most disrespectful. Yeah. No, so, okay. I'm not going to add any names. But, yeah. oh, Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Go ahead. Hello. I was a big fan of Married with the Children since I first saw it when I was before that on vacation. I've always wondered. If you guys start the script, or if you ever improvise on scenes, yeah. because it looked wild, and I, and I just was like into it so much from the first time I saw it. Well, and I think that's sort of the the, the sort of free falling aspect of it. It was scripted. We were not improvisational actors. Now, having shot six seasons of Mad TV, and the, a lot of those players came from um, uh, the Groundlings and. and uh, in, in, yeah, improvisational backgrounds. Mary was fully scripted. Um, if you got stuck in something and it wasn't working, most sets will, and directors and writers, staffs, will, they're open to a little bit of, of, um, of just riffing, if you will, to try and figure out the best way to say something. But if the writing's really good, right, you don't need to mess with it. And you can always tell if a script, have you, did you experience this when it was hard to memorize? Yeah. <laughs> that it, it really, it usually meant this writing is not it's a as, yeah, it's not as up to par because the, the, the words, the lines just wouldn't stick. That's a good question. No, we were not, were you improvising? No, the, the, the writers would sometimes improvise because we would, we would shoot, uh, on Herman's head, we would shoot, uh, 
a scene, and if there's oh, it was a joke that they thought was going to really be funny and kill, and it didn't, they would uh, they would get together there on the spot and say, come up with another joke, and then we'd reshoot the thing with that new joke. And it oh, that happened a lot, actually, <laughs> because and and because they want to land the jokes, and they don't know until they're in front of a really truly live studio audience. And I directed enough episodes that some of these series were kind of train wrecks and there was one in particular that we rewrote half the show during the taping yes. wow. and so not only did I have to re-block tell the actors where to go I had to tell all the cameras where to go again because the whole thing was changed it didn't help it <laughs> it didn't help it become a better show because it really does begin on the page don't you think oh yeah Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Did you guys, when uh, you were shooting uh, both the Herman's Head and Mary with Children, did you have issues with censors uh, with some of the jokes and stuff? <laughs> How was that on set? If you guys were working on it and somebody comes up, no, you can't do that. Well, so that usually just... goes through the the showrunners, the create the producers, and it trickles down. And um, and again, I think we got away with a lot on Fox. Mary with Children was not going to be sold to ABC, CBS, or NBC. This show never would have made it on the air were it not this little renegade uh, network. And so, but even then, uh, they had to sort of sit on um, the creator's hands sometimes and say, nah, uh, uh. What about you? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, the, the incident that comes to mind for me was, was a learning moment for me that I had said we were sort of kind of uh, improvising a little bit and uh, Hank Azaria had done something very strange who played my friend Jay in her head uh, had done something strange and I just sort of did this you know WTF look at him and then finally said you know you're, 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 you're scaring the crap out of me and uh, the censor said you can't say you can say crap but you can't say it as a substantive noun. You can say it like, um, uh, that's, well, oh, yeah, that's, you couldn't say there's, that's a load of crap, but you could say something, or staring at the crap, but you could say something like, I don't give a crap. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, and she, we went over and over and over. They were making like, it up as we went along. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, really? Wow. How do you know? And, and in the meantime, uh, Mary, or, uh, uh, Living Color was doing, you know, Handyman and all these, these things that I was like, wow, are you really going to get away with that? And uh, so, it, yeah, censorship's very yeah. odd. And uh, you can also do things before 9 o'clock, or uh, uh, after 9 o'clock that you can't do before 9 o'clock. So it's because like, people are taking baths. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm on the Married with Children train right now. <laughs> <laughs> but when you mentioned a few moments ago that you were a director, I do know that the later seasons you directed a lot of those episodes. And obviously, as everyone knows, Married with Children is kind of like an anti-white, anti-woman. Yeah. When you received any of those scripts, were you ever like, I, there's no way in hell I'm staying by a camera and filming this? And of course, other than the bad parts, what was the experience of filming? Probably one of the biggest sitcoms that ever touched television. Well, um, I have to say I didn't moan <laughs> alone at home, um, and that was even before I was directing, because there there were some things that, again, it was a universally offensive show. <laughs> I mean, everybody got made fun of, so that's sort of how they got away with it. But um, and the mean spiritedness. There were some things that I, it was hard for me. And I would also say, well, at least I don't have to say that. Um, but, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, somebody else has to say that line. Because it's our job as an actor to make it work, right? These people have written it. Um, and again, I knew what show I was on, okay? Um, I wasn't on Cheers, okay? <laughs> Nor did I get those residuals. But anyway. Um, and there were some times, but it's sort of like I knew what show I was on, so I wasn't going to try and reinvent the wheel. There were some moments on the set that I stepped in, truly, and said, um, 
and it had more to do with, you know, we had a very, um, that's a word, uh, larger than life, um, extra cast sometimes, like in the nudie bar and things like that. And sometimes these folks, uh, I could see their discomfort. <clears throat> and so I, I did step in and, and on some moments and to try and uh, make things a little more um, safe and uh, easier. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Good. Sure, sure, sure. What was your second question? It was, oh, it was pretty much just like a side of the day or so. Yeah. What was it like just for directing that show? Here you go. Well, we didn't know it was going to have, just like Friday night, we didn't know when we were making it. We had a good time, but we didn't know that it was going to have this incredible longevity. And the most important thing that you can do, especially in comedy, is have a good time. If you're not having a good time, the audience isn't going to. So if you're having fun, chances are that's going to translate, right, from the screen. And very good children, we would crack ourselves up a lot. Uh, I think I was sharing with someone that we did an episode where Katie and Chrissy and I could not stop laughing. It was that sort of like bad kids in church kind of thing where we just, and we were rolling and then one of us would crack the other. And so we were having that kind of, that kind of fun. We didn't know that it was going to end up being a rather cult classic, like like Fright Night. So um, I was again, I was just happy to be asked to the party. I remember when you when you got that. I we had the same agent at, at one point, and I had gone in to visit them, and I said, "How's it how's it going with with the manager?" And they said, "Well, she got a pilot. You know, we don't know what's going to happen with it." We're we're you know waiting to hear what's it's gonna be you know it's gonna get picked up at all you know it's like okay we'll keep our fingers crossed <laughs> well and again it was fox and we made fun of fox on mary with tour because right. it's like is anybody watching is there is there anyone out there because when it started katie seagal and i went on a national tour actually some of the actors uh can you find your fox channel because it was like in the U.S. Channel 23, 42. It was just this obscure thing because it was in syndication. UHF, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, and again, you don't get picked up. It wasn't like a Friends that was just an undeniable hit. It was like year after year, are we going to get another shot at it? Oh, we did. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about uh, the Friday Night 2. All right, I'm leaving. So, <laughs> that's like so bad. I asked Amanda about, like, were you asked to be in that movie, or was were you on Married with Children at that point? You're like, no, I'm. All right, I don't know. Did I make it up that there was another script? You, you've been consistent. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could have just it, been a fantasy. Originally, I thought we had a read, a read of another script that Amy was in. Okay. Could have made it up. But um, once they landed on the female lead, that the, that the, the, the vampire was going to be a female antagonist slash love interest, whatever, you know, a, there just wasn't a place. Well, yeah, I was doing Mary. I had a girlfriend in that movie, too. Like, you had a different girlfriend in that movie, so I just wondered if that yeah. was just written out. I mean, I think you mentioned your name in the movie, and maybe at some point. Did you? Did you mention you mentioned it at all? No. That. no. Yeah, as you can see, I'm not terribly familiar with. Um, no, I mean it just it, it it was great for Billy. I think Stephen Jeffries did a film called Nine Seven Six Evil, which was sort of a his sequel for Evil Ed. Um, yeah, I was making Marion at the time, but I would have loved. Did you have it by then? Did you get married by then? When did you make well, it? I think it's right in '89. I think. Yeah, we we were we shot the pilot Barry with Children in '86. Yeah, so yeah. You were, you were yeah. Famous. But I mean, it could have happened. They just didn't ask me to that party. Okay, I think it was a matter of they. I think it was ultimately just a matter of they wanted to make the cheapest movie they right. could, and so everybody who was oh, my salary would have been yeah. everybody was working <laughs> with a theatrical release, and I'm sure it was. But I seem to remember it more being almost straight to video than that part two, right? Like it wasn't as popular as big as the first one. I don't think, right? Well, because the guy in charge of it, uh, Jose Menendez, uh, was the Menendez brothers' father, so he got uh, terminated. So 
I think yeah. that affected. <laughs> Did that happen during? It was before, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was right before. Right before the release? Do y'all know this story? Yeah. It's a horrible, let me just bring it up. <laughs> let me talk about it. No, it was actually just a horrible, tragic murder in Beverly Hills of a, of a, a financier producer. Yes, yeah. The Menendez brothers. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so my question is actually for William. What was it like being on a set of Brothers Keeper? A brother's keeper question. Um, that was a TV show I did. Um, it was uh, it was great. We had a great time. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was um, uh, Jamie Widows and uh, who who was the sort of I guess showrunner and Donald Todd was the writer. And it was me and Sean O'Brien who was basically um, basically it was two and a half men before two and a half men and. Uh, it was great. We had, a, we had a fun time. It was, you know, sort of odd couple-ish, you know, so we got to sort of play these two different flavors that were uh, com competing and all that stuff. They were brothers, so. And uh, we actually had uh, Tony Randall and uh, Jack Pugman on an episode. The original TV odd couple came on and did an episode. And, uh, yeah, so it was good. It was fun. They, I was on the Universal lot, and I could hear the Universal tram going by, the tour tram going by. There's William Bradford. You know, funny saying my name on the tour. That's a high point of my life. And you'd run out and wave. And I was, oh hey, I didn't hear you going by. <laughs> but uh, it was great. It was fun. Is it surreal? to do what you guys do. I mean, here we are, it's we're weird. in Cornwall, Ontario, there's not much going on. We, we had a movie come through last uh, summer uh, that was, uh, uh, what, um, <coughs> it was a Christmas movie for uh, Hallmark or whatever. Right. So we don't get a lot of that, but you, know, you guys are in Los Angeles, you're in movie world. Is, is it surreal to you or is it? Is it well, know. the industry is, I mean, Los Angeles is the industry kind yeah. of thing. New York is a little different and the industry on has has had a real regentrification there in terms of in New York it was mostly Broadway, off Broadway, soap operas, that kind of thing. Um, and that's where Bill uh, William is located now. Um, uh, Hollywood land is all about that. So you're kind of saturated with it, but come on, it's a little it's a little strange way to make a living. It is. And there are moments where you're just like this is what I'm doing today. I'm just yelling at something that I can't see um, off camera or reacting to, you know. And yeah, because you, as an actor especially, you're in your imagination. And it, that's that's your job. But when you step outside of it, it's kind of like, eh, it's kind of weird. The, 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 the media is the thing that makes it so uh, surreal yeah. because you, you meet people, actors are just people, you know, they're people you do a show with or whatever. But, uh, you know, at, at some point, a media event can happen. Jennifer Aniston played my sister on Herman's Head a couple of times, you know, and we got along great. It was a nice, fun thing. And a few years later, you know, I had to go through her security system to, to say hi. You know, a lot. But I once sat in a, uh, in a in a waiting room for an audition with Adam West, you know, and and we're like the across from each other, the original Batman. Yeah, and I'm sitting across from him, and they're they're making him wait, you know, you know, because they have other people in front of him. I said, like, just take it, man. <laughs> Come on. But he was he was totally cool about it. But yeah, you know, it's like people that you're used to, you know, that you see on you you, you meet on one level that media sort of thing, and then, you know, they're just regular people. Yeah. Most of them. And then they, they and then start to believe it, and yeah. then it's like, oh. Are you pointing at me? <laughs> Jared. First for Amanda, do you think your children can get paid today in these sort of cancel culture contests? No. No, it couldn't. It really couldn't. They were talking, you know, with all these reboots that were happening of, uh, bringing the show back with uh, David Faustino who played Bud, because he was actually, by that time, which was a few years ago, Ed O'Neill's age, Al Bundy's age, so it kind of made sense. 
that he'd still be on that sofa in that same living room, you know, married with grandchildren kind of thing. But it would not, it would not fly. I mean, even in the 80s, when a lot of stuff was, they were getting away with, it was provocative. It was, um, and a lot of people didn't watch it for that reason. They were offended. Um, a lot of people watched it because it was offensive. But um, no, I don't think so. I really don't. And if, if David's show had gone, it would not have been, I don't think, quite as edgy. It couldn't have been. And unfortunately, it didn't happen. I wish it had for him. Um, but uh, one of the creators of the show has passed away. And his, his estate is very legally complicated. So I think that's what I heard, at least, why it didn't move forward. For William, I want to ask, what was your memories of working on Mannequin 2? Mannequin 2? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, I was a fan for Swanson. Yeah. 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 Well, she said some really dumb things. I'm like, wow. she was adorable. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I, I had a still. Yeah. Says some things. I'm just like, sort of separate. Yeah, she's she's. It was there sometimes. It was it was fine. It was great. Um, you know, it was it was uh, sort of like uh, Fright Night Two, the the original thing had already been done. So you're just sort of stepping into the the the, the footpath is the path that's already been trod, and so it was. It was it was easy. Christy was great and charming, and uh, Meshach Taylor, who played Hollywood Montrose, was a lot of fun, and yeah, it was it was good. They didn't ask me to be in that one either. What kind of thing did you do? Was Broadway was that the first one was when she comes like crawl. She said, "Oh, here I am, I'm alive." It's like, but she should know should know that anything like scenarios. She's from Egypt. It's like when they fix that. So we just wanted to ask you. She's asking, what is it, what are we doing? She's asking, what is it, what are we doing? She's asking, what is it, what are we doing? She's asking, what is it, what are we doing? You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it was fun. And those kinds of stories are always, you know, when you have a character who's just discovering all this stuff that we're very familiar with, you sort of see it in that fresh, like, you know, what is this? I think I, I think I had a, had a feeder of, uh, a cheese steak or something, Philly cheese steak, and it's like, what is it? And then you describe it and you go, God, why would anybody eat this? That's good. Cool. I got chopped up. And my last question was, do you guys have any souvenirs from Friday or Mary Shopping? So, for come. whatever reason, um, I wasn't smart enough to keep any of my fangs or anything, because those were cool. I, somehow I ended up with my breasts because um, at the time my natural <laughs> um, I wasn't very endowed and then when I was bitten by the vampire Tom decided my hair would turn red and I would grow breasts so these guys had to slap plaster on me in order to make them and they ended up like these foam and the candy blocks on my closet shelf for whatever reason for a long time and then lo and behold these conventions this universe really starts popping up because initially it was star trek you know the trekkies were the diehard fans and they would gather but then there was the horror fans that sort of put the convention world on the map and we came i had not seen 20 years yeah, maybe, yeah. we hadn't seen each other, the cast. So it was really fun. And I brought out those breasts. <laughs> and, uh, I auctioned them off or something. Why I was ready bring? to leave, just, I was ready to just <laughs> hand them over to someone. The next and, generation. <laughs> yeah. On, and the them. guy at the bottom, just, <laughs> anyway. You have fun with those now, and um, you should Google that. No, oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything uh, from? I didn't keep anything. I kept my wardrobe, and that was about it. But I didn't. I mean, I'm not going to keep it with the state. I didn't. Th I didn't think. I didn't think. Oh, 30 years from now, yeah. I will really want this yeah. wooden stay. You were smart pants. enough. Well, I didn't. There was no indication that it was going to be have the life that it's had, so, uh, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't really keep anything. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.
Uh, I had uh, a question to throw at you guys, and that was, is there any um, projects out there, uh, movie-wise or television, that, you know, whether it was in front of the camera or behind the camera, that you didn't get the opportunity, opportunity to do that you would have liked to? Let's just walk. Um, like say you were up for it and then up somebody else got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually was offered a part on a film that was a, it was a project that was important to me because it was written by a man named Horton Foote who wrote the screenplay for To Kill a Mockingbird. And this was, this was sort of like an actor's project, an independent film where I was flown to New York to, to read with the director. He offered me the part. And on my flight back, I lost it because by the time I landed, the um, I guess the, the production company of the film knew that he had chosen me and they said, we need a bigger name. And, um, uh, and my agency, which was a very big agency at the time said, okay, who do you want? Because they just, it didn't matter to them. And um, so that, that was a tough pill to swallow. You look at these things though, that they change the course of your career. And I do think that if I had gotten that particular film, it's a small film, but kind of an, act, an important film, um, I would have had a different career, probably more in film. And then I, instead of um, really spending most of my time in television, which back then it was sort of looked at as two different and film was the elite, and television was the little, but I was thrilled to just work. Yeah. And um, so, and then that sort of evened itself out, and now it's just about where the good writing is and just being able to do the, do the work. What about you? Dozens. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think it's listed on my IMDb thing, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think it is. I is was, it really? Yeah, yeah. I was Almost up for not. Ferris Bueller. I was up for Ferris Bueller and Project X and uh, Name of the Rose, and uh, I mean, everybody, everyone, yeah. uh, Iron Eagle, all the Matthew stuff. Broderick. Uh, yeah. Anything Matthew Broderick was yeah. on Patrick. Ah, oh, he got another one. Ah. Yeah. And, uh, well, and Bill was on Broadway with the Neil Simon play. Oh, good so. uh, but did okay for I was here. technically uh, committed to Herman's head because when you when they cancel a show, they don't just cancel it after you're done. They want to wait till the upfronts. They want to wait till May, you know, till till the last minute to to announce that you you're not going to be coming back. And that was the spring that they made the Friends pilot. Okay. And uh, and I had seen that, and people had said, "Oh, this would be a great thing for you." And I was like, "I'm under contract still. I, just couldn't, I couldn't audition for it." So uh, so that may have happened or may not. But people would be, it, might be just going, "David Schwimmer, who?" Yeah, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, there's tons of things. Tons of things. But uh, you know, I have a friend, uh, a guy named Jeff Yeager, who is an actor, and um, who you may know, but he was the he was cast and was the original star of Twenty One Jump Street, and they had done the pilot, and uh, they were getting ready to, to go to series, and uh, 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 Diller was his name. Barry Diller. Barry Diller said, no, I want to do something about the lead. So yeah. they got rid of Jeff and they brought in Johnny Depp. Um, now starring in court. Yeah, yeah starring in the court. I court have drama. riveted. Has anybody watched? Do you get in here? Oh, oh yeah. my God. Have you seen any of it? No. Oh, no, it's <laughs> nothing like this. <laughs> it's none of your business. <laughs> what? You think he's I think they're both accountable. Yeah. It was a very dysfunctional and destructive and a lot of substance abuse on both parts. Nothing was good. No. Why he wants to, why he chose to, it's his choice to counter sue or what, knowing that this information was going to come forward. That to me is the, the craziest thing. Uh, and, and all that, just you know, put a cap on it, just all that's, that come, that's coming out. And to know that, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean was just, you know, a moneymaker for him. And now he can't even put on the cap to go to the hospitals anymore and do that kind of stuff, right? To just allow that, it's, it's just amazing to, to think that they're going through that. Well, and it, unfortunately, what I've learned is that the level of substance abuse is yeah. fierce. And there's... Very rare for anything good to come out. No. Yeah, yeah. 
It's unfortunate. Um, You're back. Right, I'm back. Okay. I was going to say something back there, but I don't think I can hear you. So. <laughs> uh, was Friday a long shoot? And the other question is, um, was it all on a soundstage? Because I noticed a lot of it looked like it was on a soundstage. Or is there anything on location for that movie? Because it looked like, like even the neighborhood where your house was, that don't look like it was kind of a soundstage. It's a back lot. It was the Disney back lot. Yeah. And it's no longer there. Okay. So, so that house, Jerry Dandridge's house and Charlie nice Brewster's stuff. house next door, they're gone. Too bad. Because that, especially the Jerry, and these were exteriors only. I mean, you'd open the door and there's nothing there. Yeah, um, shelves. And then we shot on location um, for the nightclub. Okay. And yeah. on the street when we were running oh, yeah, and being chased on the street. Yeah, the, the whole first part of the, of the shoot, the first three or four weeks, was all exterior stuff. So, yeah, so that was around town. And, and part of it on a lot and stuff like that. And it was a rather long shoot. It was three months ish. Okay. Yeah. And we had two weeks of rehearsal time, which was quite a luxury. Yeah. And I and I had uh, when we first moved into the, the studio pretty early on I broke my foot during one of the takes. Tension getting behavior. <laughs> Just me, 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 me. Uh, but and I was I was really concerned that it would replace me. Because it was, you know, because I was hobbling and stuff, and I think someone had said, "Don't worry, it would cost them a fortune to redo all that location right. stuff." So you're fine, you know. Right. And so, in that sense, it's good that we nice. got it done. Uh, is that typical for a movie duration? Is three months? Four no. months? No. 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 It, it, much. Well, it depends on how. For a smaller picture, that was even though it was a major studio, Columbia. Um, it, it was not considered a big picture. Um, most horror films in that day especially were not. Um, you know, and bigger pictures of course now are the marbles and the, the, just, the just the franchises and so forth. Um, but your, an average shoot um, on a moderate budget is, is more around like a month or 45 days. Depends on the film, really. And but the, in those days too, it was, uh, you know, now uh, all the departments are going at the same time. So they, you shoot a scene, it's already gone to the editor, right? Because it's all digital now. Yeah. But and you know, in those days, you had to, you shot it, you hoped it was okay, you hoped there was no hair in the gate of the thing. You would see the dailies the next day, or somebody would, you know. And they would then they would choose, and then it would go to the editor. So it's much longer process. And uh, but uh, yeah, it was just, I had when I broke my foot, I that the insurance money from that because they had the production was insured bought us time actually, so they could actually slow down production to to take a little more time on it. So I didn't know that. Yeah, old thing, and I. Uh, well, and thanks then, for doing that. Well, I mean, my pleasure. Right, anytime. That's great. And I, I had never, a trooper. I had <laughs> never shot a big movie like that before. So the doctor, the the, the podiatrist or whatever, had at some point when I was talking to him said, "So it's, uh, so this is really slowing stuff down." So I was like, "I don't. I mean, I'm an actor. I'm just waiting most of the day for them to set up stuff." I said, "I don't. It doesn't seem like it to me. But you know, maybe I'm wrong." So he told the insurance company that. I said that I wasn't slowing this down that much. So then they got into this big tiff, of course. The insurance company and the production. Yeah. That's what I was on uh, Fright Night, uh, working with like the special effects, like with fangs and with blood and all that kind of stuff. I, I'm assuming that was a lot of fun to do. I don't know if you had done it before that. Yeah, it'd be easy. I didn't have any. Um, well, and I talked with some folks here about it. You know, this was all practical effects. Yeah. This, this was no CGI. And now there seems to be this resurgence with uh, old school yeah. uh, coming back around. Because there is something about CGI that separates you from the action, that separates you from what's going on. And um, it's like you enter a video game or something. Uh, and we were the guinea pigs. And Richard Etlin's group, who designed the special effects for Fright Night, they were the sort of top at, uh, echelon. But there's this competition to outdo each other. And the humans were, were the ones who were having to, yeah. And uh, 
but again, I'm not gonna squeak the wheel. I finally had to one time, because I had three different, you may know the story, three different contact lenses that I had to wear, and you couldn't really see out of them because they were painted. You could have a little pinpoint, and, they, and I never wore lenses, so I, it was kind of alien for me to begin with. And the last pair they put in, I just was, and they would put them in right at the last minute before we'd start rolling, and I just couldn't, you know, there was something going on, but when things are all coming in and it's getting ready to go, you do not want to be the one that says, excuse me, but I finally had to do that. And they took them out, and they hadn't sanded them. They hadn't sanded the paint off the back of the lens, so they were literally scratching my eyes, and that wasn't good. Um, but again, it's, it's all in the excitement of the filmmaking process. Um, my big mouth thing on Fright Night was a very last minute decision. They turned that around within 48 hours, and uh, it was an effective moment, turns out. Hey, Derek. Uh, I have a question for both is for Fright Night. Uh, what was your best part of the movie in the shoot? I love making out with Billy. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, wow. The best part. What the what the kissing. Yeah, right. Um, I am. Uh, uh, Did you I, have a favorite? Seen this I, I had the picture at my table, who uh, I'd be able to purchase. Uh, no, about the, the one, uh, the day that we were all together, yeah. we had gone over to, the, uh, I go over with Roddy and, and, and Amy and uh, Ed, and to, to prove that Dandridge is not a vampire, we take the holy water and all this stuff. And so we were all together that day. There it is, right there. He's got it right there. Okay. Um, and that was one, I mean, it was only a day or maybe two that we were all together on the same set. The whole cast badly yes. behaved, very badly. Uh, no, the director, you, you tell that story. He what? got mad. Did he? Yes, that we were cutting up oh, a little bit, joking. having a little too much fun. Uh, yeah, I don't remember that. Oh, so well, yeah. I just yell at them, but uh, but yeah, that was that was a lot of fun too. Because we had already sort of that was late in the shoot, and uh, you know we had already sort of formed friendships and stuff, and that was great that we all got to be around together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, for Fright Night, that early in your career, was it, uh, I can't wait to do this as a, a this, you know, horror movie uh, genre, or is it like, oh my god, I got a job, I can't wait to, to uh, get paid, you know, kind of thing? I think it's first the job. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and ironically, I had been making a, my first feature um, that year uh, was with Stephen Jeffries really memorable film called Fraternity Vacation, Go Rush and Get It. Anyway, we, he was the lead and we played um, Boyfriend Girlfriend. And we're hanging out on the set at the end of the shoot going in Steven's very Steven. And I said, so what are you up to? What did, you know, what's anything coming up? And he said, well, I'm making this little horror movie called Fright Night. And I said, me too. <laughs> so that was kind of strange and wonderful um, that we, we really truly rolled right into that next job. Yeah, I was, yeah, it was, uh, I, I remember getting the script and on the front of the script it had the Columbia Pictures uh, logo, you know, the Corona and the woman. And I, that, was, that was enough for me. It was like, hey, look, I got a real script from a real movie. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so yeah, it was awesome. But in the day, it was the horror that was the star. Yes. And even though we were fortunate enough to have, first of all, a beautifully written script, and two really fine actors in Roddy and Chris, who had you know, quite a, a resume behind them, it was still looked at as a horror movie. Um, it was a major movie, but it did, you know, that, that too has changed. Yeah, and it yeah. all has to do with franchise and how much money they make and all, and all that. And also the fact that they're good movies, right? So Yeah, and I, I would go to auditions and stuff with casting people and, would, you, know, just, you know, mention Fright Night and stuff. They said, well, I, I, don't, I don't see movies like that. Like so one of the casting people you're going to sort of, you know, uh, get to know and meet and all that stuff, say they, they haven't seen it and they're not going to, it's, you know, just because it's a horror movie, it's frustrating. I just want to come back to something you said uh, later, 
Um, when you did Fright Night, you never thought that you were going to do something that would become a cult classic, right? When is the time you realized that this was a huge movie for the times to come? Really, probably around this universe. Yeah. yeah. Truly, because it was 20 years later. 2005? Right. Mine was 2009. We've had this discussion. Oh, that's I was right. like, you guys came to it before I did. Uh, yeah, and it, I was surprised. It was like, what? Yeah, I mean, it was an interest it was in it. It's a modestly well received <coughs> movie initially, and you know that was fine. And then, but it was this. It was the first of many that was going to come, as far as we were concerned. I think, and and uh, and it wasn't until we started getting into the convention world. And people, you know, with their children and their grandchildren showing up, being a fan of the movie, and that we thought, oh, this thing is, this is more yeah, than you a, all that have kept it yeah, alive. Yeah, it's the, you the all fans. are the popular culture too, and and we just kind of sit back and go, what? That's cool. <laughs> you know, um, and the two things because I went behind the camera for so many decades, the two things that I'm known for as an actor ended up being these cult classic things, and how lucky that I could go and talk to people about that part of my career. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I have a follow-up question on this. Um, with that trend uh, for reboots uh, mixed with sequels, would something like, let's just say, Fright Night 2.5 instead of Fright Night 3 or whatever with the remix, would you accept a role for this Fright Night? Oh, just my heart. Well, yeah. you know, they did do, and Chris Sarandon puts it well, a reimagining of Fright Night with Colin Farrell and Tony Collette and, you know, David Tennant. It, and as a standalone horror movie, I thought it was good. It, it was not the same um, sort of energy behind the original one. Um, again, it's kind of hard to capture an era like the 80s, you know, 30 years later. Um, so they did do what they call the remake. Um, but then a lot of fans of the first two uh, didn't care for it because of that, because they didn't feel like it it, it really was remade. Right. Um, but, oh, of course. Tom has written a book. Yeah, Tom, the original writer-director, has written a couple of novels about it. So uh, one, I can't remember the name of the first one, but the second one, which is out and available, uh, but there's a second called Billy's Bones, which is about Billy Cole, who you know turns into you know decomposes uh, at the end of the movie, but apparently survives somehow too. So it's based on Tom didn't even know what he was because he was like, "What is he? A ghoul? Is he a zombie?" He's like, "I don't know." What are the rules? I don't know. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're getting to the end of our time, but uh, I uh, wanted to ask one last question. Marcy Rhodes or Marcy Darcy? <laughs> I know what you're asking. Um, I love working with David Garrison. Yeah. He's a tremendous actor and still a good friend. I saw him the other night. And, um, you know, Ted's a different kind of actor. It was a different kind of character. Um, we were already kind of we have gone from, the original show had a lot more with, I mean, the first season or two was the Bundys and the, the next door neighbors. And then the kids grew up, and Chrissy was always a fine actor, but they could write more towards the kids, and, and it really was about the Bundy family, and, and we were, the neighbors were sort of this appendage. Um, so David and I got to do more, really, in terms of storyline. That was part of the fun. And then by the time Ted came along, the show was so buffoonish, it was so cartoonish. And and that's sort of where that landed. But I, I actually, I although the name Marcy Darcy is pretty <laughs> fabulous, excuse me, pretty fabulous. Um, yeah, Marcy Rose, okay. yeah. Excellent. And he left me, really. <laughs> Did you have to do it that way? Was was he did, was he just going to do something else? Why did he leave the show? That's a story. I will say that here's for the for publication. He was he's a New York guy. He's not an LA guy, and he was the only character that was written for him. 
none of the, you know, everyone else was cast into it. Yeah. The character of Steve was written for David because he had done a show called It's Your Move with these creators with uh, Jason Bateman's first okay. series. So they loved David and wrote the part for him. David was just not happy with the way the show was evolving and he was ready, he was itching to get back to Broadway. And uh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Any other? Uh... Thanks for having us. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you.